Uh, <laughs> really, if we can match life. those up, <laughs> yeah. side pours and insane clown posse. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. Like a Fago slushy, you know? Like <gasps> Hatchet, man. Let's go. It's running running with the hatchet. That and thing's got weird. Also, yeah. how many juggalos are Cicerones? Please call in to the <laughs> number at the end of this podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Hen House Unruffled, an audio companion to the beers of Hen House Brewing Company. Each episode, we'll take a deeper dive into each beer's concept, recipe, can art, sensory, and more with your hen host, Fridge. What up? What's up, Unruffled listeners? It's Fridge, your host for the Hen House Unruffled podcast, and welcome to the first ever grab bag episode. Sayer and Bob are here with me, and we're going to be pulling subjects out of a hat to speak about live on the Unruffled podcast. Let's get it going. This is not at all because our guests couldn't make it. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. (laughs) Note that I cannot see. The names are all on the inside, so I can't see the topics. So Mm -hmm. the topics are well sorted. And we should say, right now in the world is a delicious collaboration between us and Ruse Brewing called Something Something Marvelous Marvelous, West Coast Double IPA. I'm touching some right now. It is delicious. And we had hoped to have our friends from Ruse calling in today. Um, They're working on something real big. I won't step on that announcement from them, but very cool news from Ruse is coming and uh, had a little bit of just uh, work emergencies today. Weren't able to join us. We pivoted. We've got Bob here, Fridge here, me Sayer here. We've Hell got a grab yeah. bag full of topics, and we're going to get into it right now. I'm going to re-rummage. Woo-hoo. While Sayer is shuffling, I just want to throw a quick shout-out to Ruse. There are a great many breweries whose beer I truly love and am always excited to drink, and they're one of those. But honestly, there's a tight handful of breweries whose branding and uh, marketing and naming conventions and labeling am I as stoked on as I am stoked on what we do here at Hen House and God damn if Ruse does not do it. I love their labels. I love the consistency across it. I love their kind of two interesting words next to each other conveying something, naming conventions. Mm-hmm. It's it's just great, and I just love how they nail it. It feels very contemporary, and uh, I love what they did with like our imaging, working it into something that is like authentically Ruse. Well, Bob, you're going to be blown away because I just pulled out a piece of paper, and the first thing on it is something marvelous, our new collaboration with Ruse Brewing. So let's get into it. Let's get into it into it hell yeah um, i would say i think i'd word it even more strongly about like where where ruse sits for me and it it's such a victory for the burst distribution program because that's how come i know about them right so uh, for those that don't know hen house also has a distribution company where we buy beer from other breweries and sell it here in our market and when that started it was with a very small number of people whose beer we always carried and what it's really evolved into is a large number of people whose beer just kind of pulses into the market a few times a year. Ruse comes out of our relationship with Great Notion and our relationship with our distributor up there, Day One Distribution. Day One handles Ruse's distribution of their beer in their home market. And I forget whether it was Robbie from Day One or someone from Great Notion that was just like, you guys need to to holler at Ruse. Like, they're really doing it right now. Which, being in our position, having someone tell you a brewery is spectacular is something that happens every week. Sure. <laughs> um, but I, for some reason, I remember whoever told me, I was like, okay, this sounds serious. And then I Googled them. And at that time, they had just finished their first year of existence. And they had won Best New Brewery in Portland, along with Best Brewery in Portland in their first year. Not bad. Yeah. And then we got to taste the beers. And I think they, honestly, them and Great Notion are on a short list. I would put Slice on this list. Um, certain beers from Moonraker. The like my sort of personal platonic ideal for hazy, where it just is massive aroma, tons of palate weight, but still somehow finishes clean. Word. Um, and Ruse nails that. We brought down not this current burst that includes our collab, but the one prior, we brought down a bunch of their wet hop stuff. Um, and I was chasing that down on draft all over the bay, and like, my god, man. Just really outstanding hoppy stuff. They make great lagers, too. Got to visit the taste room and taste a slushy beer they did that was just elite. It was uh, elite is the best (laughs) way to describe that. It was so good. And, like, the viscosity was just perfect. It wasn't too much. It wasn't too too little. Like, you could tell there was a clear difference there. And, you know, those beers are really sweet and fruit forward. But somehow, by God, they found a way to balance it, which really reminded me of our production team's ability to take crazy styles and bring some kind of temperance to it that makes mm-hmm. it better for it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, if you really wanted to oversimplify it, it you know, the, the perfectly Brian Huntian quote 
uh, he was being interviewed on the Brewing Network, and they asked him, what's the most important piece of equipment in the brewery? And without missing a beat, he just stared at these dudes who, like, all they care about is, like, technical home brewing shit. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And just stared at these dudes and said, well, obviously the tasting glass. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that's the thing, right? Is like, a palette is a really powerful tool, and it's so clear that the folks at Ruse have a palette, because no matter what they're attempting... It arrives at you, and it's delicious, and it's drinkable. So super thrilled to get to work with them, selling their beer, but now making beer, too. And I can't wait to bring them down here and host. Like Their brewery's a little bit smaller than ours, so only 20 barrels of this beer got made. It was dry hopped to shit, so only probably like 16 barrels of it got yielded. And Mm -hmm. I think about eight barrels of it made it to all nine counties of the Bay Area. So this one will be hard to come by, but if you get a chance to get your hands on it, something marvelous, West Coast Double IPA, is in the world at the time you are hearing this. Track it down and enjoy it, because it is delicious. Yeah, shout out to my buddy Mike Molchanoff for turning me on to them, and it's his favorite brewery as well, and I always trust his opinion. And um, I was happy to to hear that he was uh, involved in some of the naming conventions there as well. So he's like, oh, I named that one when, when we went there and drank it. I was like, oh, that's awesome, dude. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Small world, man. Yeah. Yeah. And also a uh, shout out to our main man with the Mechnikawi or Kaufiai, Bobby Tall, Bobby Tall, who was up there brewing this beer with them. Um, there's probably not a lot of interstate beers being brewed during the pandemic that actually gets someone from the visiting team uh, on the court in your brewery, but we made that happen in part thanks to the folks at Day One for helping us have such an awesome time up in Portland. Shout out to the folks at Function, too. Yeah, and that's actually what made this possible. So the reason we got so much of this beer is, if this is illegal, cut it out of the podcast. Our empties went from Function to Ruse, got filled with this collab, and came back to us. Instead of shipping empty steel, which is a really shitty use of petroleum resources. Indeed. We filled that steel back up with delicious double IPA, and it is here now, and you can drink it. And Closing I hope that's loop. not illegal, because that's just like... Re- that's I don't think it's illegal because you know, exists. It's, it's, yeah. uh, right. like using renewable yeah. energy. <laughs> it would be illegal if we slapped the wrong label on the top, but I think there it is. failing that, I think we're good. Uh, don't fact check me, TTB, or whoever... The organization I've just offended is. They don't listen to this podcast anyways. Long story short, whatever it is, <laughs> they have it over at Ruse, and we're stoked to be uh, working with these guys. Absolutely. And a last quick shout out at Slow Deer on Instagram and your other social media for the uh, graphic, the first time anyone has ever married a hen in a house on a hen house label. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. It is it is literally a hen house. It's marvelous. and You might say it's something marvelous. <laughs> it's really well executed, and I just, I just absolutely love their style. I remember the exchange in the emails when that label was going back and forth. Mike was like, I had to stop myself because I was like, why the fuck is the hen in it? Oh. <laughs> it, does, it did take me like remarkably longer to get it than, I, than it should have. <laughs> and then when I did get it, it was all the sweeter for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very cool looking thing. We should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I need that shirt. Yeah. Or, or that tattoo even. Like, let's just go. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a topic in here. Let's see which one we have now. All Out of right. the grab bag comes. Beer education. Bung bung. Is it accessible? Is it worth it? Yeah. Sounds like Bob might have thrown that in the grab bag. T- I t- did. Tell us some more, Bob. Um, that is one of the things that I do the most here at Hen House, and it's definitely the thing I think about the most. I don't sit and contemplate Cascade hops. I don't even sit and contemplate genetically modified yeast. I definitely sit and contemplate beer education, and then that is closely tied to certification. In other things, Cicerone is the main thing, but there are other things out there that don't get as much talk about them or aren't as good or as interesting. And who's it for? What do you do? The The argument as to whether or not the Cicerone thing is a form of gatekeeping or a form of knocking down that gate. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because learning about beer, a lot of the, these kind of weird, super outdated old models that predate me, which is show up at a brewery, offer your labor for free, doing mm-hmm. incredibly dangerous mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. That's not a thing anymore. But that definitely was. Um, home brewing, getting exposed to that. I hear that. Beer being predominantly a, largely a cis white male thing, and even like an older cis white male thing. What's available to everybody, theoretically, is the education component. And you can go out and get that. And then because you didn't have the casual beer uh, education experience of learning from people or using your whiteness to like get you in the door so people mm-hmm. will explain mm-hmm. things to you, or walking into a room, being curious, and then looking like everybody else in that room and having the people in that room 
want to share their information with you versus them trying to like vet you or figure out why you're there as an outsider to them. Some folks say, well, I have comparatively equal access to getting the certification and I can do that and show that to would be gatekeepers as my pass through those doors. I also hear that, well, these things cost money. These things cost time. If you don't have any time or money, I don't know how to get any of these certifications if you don't have time or money. You got to take time to study and you got to pay to get certified. So that's an issue. And we're seeing scholarships pop up uh, now to try and break down those barriers. And then you get to the, well, I know the difference between a Dortmunder Export and a Munich Hellas. And in what way does that get me paid? Or in what way is that useful to a brewery? When you say to a brewery, I've got a good grasp on what Vienna Malt does. And then they say, well, we only brew with marshmallow fluff around here. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's Vienna Malt? <laughs> like, then you're like, well, well, dang. Um, what was I doing there? And it's it's an interesting co- it's an interesting topic. I've seen it kind of change and grow as our brewery has changed and grown. I've also seen it change and grow as the industry has changed and grown. You know, once upon a time, you're like, we don't make adjunct lager. We make Vienna lagers here. And then you're like, oh, I understand that. And like in 2003, that was cool and useful. I still think it's very cool, but I don't know that it's as useful as it used to be. Are these, is having this information useful to guests? I don't know. Y'all are out here uh, living and sipping and interacting with people with me. So what are some of your impressions? I got a lot of, a lot to respond. There was a lot in there. So I may ask you yeah. guys to refresh to the different stages. So I was the 80th Cicerone in the world. And at that time, there was essentially no retail beer expertise. Yeah. There was like an unbelievable amount of just faux expertise that was wrong, right? You know, the the amount of times I heard the India Pale Ale nostalgia for lies thing, right? And I mean, worse than that too, like in beer magazines, there would be just blatant falsehoods, right? Like there was just a, a big lack. So I always advocated that people move through the Cicerone program or BJCP, because BJCP has also always been out there. It's yeah. not retail focused at all. It's just technical knowledge. But both of them give out certifications. Yeah. And I do think certification is a potentially useful thing to combat structural racism. It softens one barrier. It doesn't mean it removes the rest. Right. Right? If you don't have money and you don't have time, it's going to be hard. Right. Cicero won't solve that for you. Right. However, if you go to an interview, if you get to the interview, if you've found the access to that spot and you've applied and gotten to the point where there's an interview and you present a resume and your resume includes a certified Cicero certification or a high level BJCP certification and they give the job to someone who doesn't have it, you might have a case. Right. Right. That's what certification is really for. Right. right? That's where it can really come into play. And hopefully you won't get there because... I can tell you as someone who's done a ton of hiring in this industry, when you're at working at the cool place, you get way too many fucking resumes. Yeah. And before we had an HR department here, which is the first place I've ever worked with an HR department, yo, I would take any means of sorting those resumes. Yeah. Right? Like, I got 100 resumes for a goddamn server position, and I'm very busy. Like, right. what am I going to do? And inevitably, what that led to, and I really had to check myself on this, was just the fraternal hires. Right. Right? You're like, oh, you know somebody? I don't have to go to this giant stack of fucking resumes and do 13 interviews. Tell Jimmy to come by. Yeah. (laughs) Right? And that's how we hired so many people. I've hired people that way, too. Because it was just so much easier. And and no one is like, oh, take the week off, Bob. You're hiring. Right? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I may not be here without that kind of hiring. So So the, the thing you can do, certification can be useful for, is literally slap a filter on there. Right? Like, if you can't produce this... Level of certification, even if it's just certified beer server or if it's just the entry level BJCP or whatever it might be, depending on the role you're looking for, you're not going to get past that first thing. And then if somebody really wants that job, there is something that and then, you know, there's a whole other discussion of cultural bias within a test, which every every certification exam should be evaluated for that. But that person can go get that and then they can jump that one hurdle. I think at least in that sense, certification can be a tool for good, especially in an industry where all of the applicants probably know more than the hiring person when you're talking about the retail side. Right. Right. If, if a restaurant group is hiring a beer expert, the person doing that hiring 
probably knows a lot about payroll and like how to stretch, you know, their their procurement dollar and all of that stuff. They probably don't know the difference between a Dortmunder and a German Pils. Right. Right. And so both applicants are going to know more than that person and be able to impress them. Right. And then one gets to say, but I have the piece of paper that says I know my shit and they don't. Yeah. Right. And so I do think it's useful in that sense. I'm trying to think of the other. There was so much in there I wanted to respond well, yeah, to. Like I still think while I was kind of, you know, getting into like Vienna Lager and stuff, I do still feel like I'm definitely on team get certified. I've been chasing a, a certification myself advanced Cicerone for like two years now, not because the test is crummy, but because my life has been very inconvenient. <laughs> but um, I'll be taking it again here in, in a couple of days, or maybe after you've listened to this, I am an advanced Cicerone. But uh, I also wanted to quickly shout out, Sarah says he's the 80th. For folks who don't know, there's 4,200 plus now. And, I'm old, man. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I just, I think that, I think that's rad. And I, I was telling the other folks on the team that I was having a, a series of situations in airport beer dispensaries that were begging for Cicerones and having someone who knew anything about anything that was going on, they're doing the work. And I can absolutely see where if they had someone who knew these simple things that I knew, they would be making more money more quickly and delivering a better guest experience mm. for sure. Mm. Yeah. I uh, appreciated your uh, Iron Man moment there with the I am advanced Cicero. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I like that it can manifesting. Be, right, manifested. Um, I like that uh, it can be potentially an equalizer. You know, it's something that you're both touching on of bringing that certification to combat, you know, casual racism, you know. Right. You know, like, hey, this person has a certification here, you know. But in another breath, there is a privilege element to it. Yeah. You know, the time, the money, um, and the access, mm -hmm. you know. As far as, like, for my personal journey, I think that the education piece is really important. I am inspired by the people around me. Right. So I, I right. look look to you yourself, Bob, and I want to go on like a similar journey that you've been on, you know, because I think that being able to prove that you have spent the time and the energy and you have the knowledge base to back that up, you know? Yeah. You put your eggs in that basket and you make the omelet, you know? Right. And it's not the only way to prove that you have it. Not right? at all. Um, certainly in the wine world, there are people who get certified with their sommeliers and there's people who've been incredibly valuable to that world who never went about doing it. Right. I did recall the other part I wanted to respond to, which was you're basically talking about the challenge of certification and of like, we want to be able to test people on things that are objective. You have to be able to test people on things that are objective. Right. And then also somehow stay in touch with what's going on in craft beer right now. Yeah. And that's really challenging. Yes. Right? Like what's objectively good tart slushy beer? Right. Right. Like that's just being figured out right now. Right. Yeah, so there's no BGCP, uh, you know, page on that. <laughs> right. And even if there was, it would be, I mean, there were, B, there was a BGC page on Brown IPA for like five minutes. You yeah. Know? Right. Like it can be, it can be reactive. So that's challenging. So I, but, so I do think, I think that can be really difficult. And that's where it's like, when you're looking to educate people like, man, I really want to run you through the classic styles and make sure you know how to identify all the classic beer flaws. Make sure you know why fobs are bullshit. That that wouldn't be on the Cicerone exam. That's just a Sayer original. Uh, the That's but, a wrong answer on the Cicerone <laughs> test. That is actually. actually a wrong answer on the Cicerone <laughs> test. Yeah, so it, it is I could I could very much see the challenge as then a practical educator in the world wanting to not waste people's time and give them, you know, things that are actually applicable to what they do in their jobs. And it's very hard, you know, the amount of questions and it was granted it was a long time ago, but they were relevant even then, about like where a Ordinary bitter becomes a best bitter becomes a strong bitter was ESB when I first took the test and right. then it got renamed, which is like, okay, I get it. That makes sense to me. I understand. There are measures of gravity and intensity. Also, I think I maybe could have purchased like four ESBs and zero ordinary bitters at that point in my life. Right. Yeah. You know? Um, Not exactly relevant, right. especially and, in the American and, market. And like, it doesn't make me better at serving my customers in any sort of direct way. Yeah. So I totally empathize with that, and I don't have a good answer for what to do there other than, like, you kind of have to do both. Well, what if there yeah. was a certification process that didn't require you to actually pay anything, you know? Like, 
if that existed, would that be better than the Cicerone? Are we just, you know, using this because it is the best form of measurement in the industry, you know? Right. And has anyone tried to create something else that could be a little bit there more accessible? There was a beer sommelier certification competitor for a brief time that was far easier when I looked at it. Yeah. Um, and the MBAA was doing something. The Master Brewers Association of the Americas was doing one, and that was something that people were stoked on because it was nonprofit. I remember in 2010 when I was like first learning there was a thing like called beer, some people were like, oh, Cicerone's like a cash grab. And this was a Sierra thing. I was learning about this in Chico. And yeah. Sierra was trying to use, at the time, trying to use the um, MBA beer steward program. But it is much, much simpler. Mm -hmm. There is a lot fewer pieces to that. And you have to know a lot less. And it's just not going to deliver what, uh, what Cicerone delivers. Yeah, and I, I mean, I also am. I'm speaking as a Master Brewers Association of the Americas uh, beer, steward. beer steward. There was a lot less, like there was handling beer, but there wasn't much serving pairing. Yeah, yeah. serving pairing draft stuff. Yeah. Um, that was all that on there. They had at the time, and then they they have since canceled that program. And I've heard it's coming back around. I've I Google it every once in a while to see what's up, and I haven't seen anything lately. But great pin. They give you a great enamel pin. It's so much cooler than the Cicerone pin. I've lost I, all my Cicerone pins. Oh. <laughs> well, you can order more. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the low cost of $12.99 <laughs> plus shipping and handling. Yeah. I'm waiting on my, my draft specialist pin. Mm. That's supposed to be uh, coming. Oh, yeah. So the idea that uh, Cicerone was like a cash grab and you could... The MBAA program still cost money, but it was going to the MBAA like not some person or collection of people or some business. And... That seemed like a cool thing. Like, ultimately, the money still has to come from somewhere. Or, I mean, I think even BJCP costs money mm -hmm. to yeah, take. It does. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm pretty sure no one's getting a dime out of that, right? I have no idea where that money goes. But the, yeah, the BJCP throws all kinds of competitions and produces um, literature. And uh, they do the magazine, right? Zymergy yeah. is. Yeah. Is that them? yeah. No, Zymergy is uh, American Homebrewers Association. Ah. But they're all right. closely interlinked. Um, but I do think you're onto something like in a less business minded world, does the BA just buy Cicerone? Exactly. Right? Yeah. And it's just like, oh, you want to be a BA, like part of BA membership. And like, it just is, you know, it was the kind of thing it's a like union would do. Members. Exactly. Yeah. It's the kind of thing a union would do for continuing education to make sure their workforce was doing the best they possibly could on behalf of the product. Yeah. And I think like when and it big is beer like beer was a bigger threat, yeah. it would have probably been an easier sell as an investment because like the more educated beer drinkers we make, the less. Budweiser drinkers there's going to be, right? Right. But I think, I think we might have just won that yeah. <laughs> fight. And uh, yeah. now I think you'd have to, I, I mean, yeah, it, I could see it being a real mess, but I, I do love that as kind of like a idyllic vision is like, yeah, you yeah know, like every the brewery beer you pays a little bit, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Every brewery pays a little bit into this thing and every employee starts down the track. Yeah. Um, and anyone from outside who wants to get in the industry, that's a way they can start too, you know? Um, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. I love the union analogy. I think that, you know, like in an ever-changing industry, you know, there's parallels. You know, like uh, you have to take a test to make sure you know how to do electrical shit every couple of years. You right. know, exactly. Medical technology changes uh, rapidly. Yeah. Um, and beer is always changing, too, yeah. you know? Yeah. If I may literally curse myself, I wish that Cicerone and beyond had like a continuing education thing. I think that's really important. And I'd like to see that be a thing in the future. Like once uh, I get to advanced. If I had passed the master that I missed by, you know, five percentage points or whatever, I'm pretty sure I could be a master Cicerone rocking around right now who didn't know about biotransformation. Yeah. Just based on when I took the test. Right. right. Or, or perhaps maybe that's why I didn't pass. But <laughs> <laughs> didn't but, know about yeah. stuff. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like the industry, that that's a massive change yeah. in the way beer is showing up in people's glasses now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just got a, I passed a little like draft specialist kind of bonus thing, but I don't know anything about side pours. I don't know how to like install. A, actually, I mean, you know, of course, you I do. can start talking Come about on. it. <laughs> but no one certified my. No one certified what I know about it. Do I really know anything? Yeah. Ray Daniels hasn't graded what I know. <laughs> and you know, another one of the things you hear about is that it's like it's about being snobby and highfalutin, and um, that is not true. And 
Anyone? Also, that's hardly the only source. There's a lot of people who don't know shit, could never pass a Cicerone exam, who are snobby as fuck. Dude, about they pollute. The, the highfalutinist. Yeah. <laughs> there are so much, there's so much falutin. Um, but the understanding of the fundamentals of a draft system, which I harp on constantly and will harp on forever, is there's nothing falutin about being on your knees in a giant refrigerator with beer soaking through your jeans. Mm -hmm. um, that's falut free. And. Uh, what you are doing then Having and there, flashbacks, Bob. Yeah, yeah, what you're doing then and there is like the most crucial thing for your business, for guest experience. If we're talking beer, and to to discount that or to say that like that doesn't have value is bonkers. And I really feel like a certified beer server, the first level of the Cicerone program, does a great job of getting everyone on this same page for what beer is and what we're talking about. And that's where they're making their money, for sure. I have no idea what Ray Daniels' books are like, but <laughs> there's no way that gathering like 40 of like the dopest nerds in the world and like I don't know, 10 or 12 of like the coolest beer authors in the same room, there's no way that that is a profitable day for anybody. I would say that Cicerone and probably Advance aren't that profitable either, maybe a little more, but When see, I was working for them CBS is uh, master bucks, sure. definitely cost them money. Every time yeah. they threw a master exam, it cost them a lot of money. Yeah. Is uh, there like a gathering of the Cicerones, a la like the gathering of the Juggalos? Or? Those are two things I would like to be involved in. Uh, <laughs> really, if we can match life. those up. <laughs> yeah. Side pours and unsane clown posse. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. Like a Fago slushy, you know? <gasps> like Hatchet, man. Let's go. It's running running with the hatchet. That thing's got weird. Lead. Also, how many Juggalos are Cicerones? Please call in to the <laughs> number at the end of this podcast. <laughs> All right, we're moving on to the next one. Also, I love uh, how much podcast content we got out of the fact that they couldn't pour Bob a two-hearted at the airport. Was that what it was? Yup. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and at a different spot, this poor bartender was asked the question, do you have any good Pilsners? And the poor bartender was like, just Bud Light. And the poor person said, what about this Yingling lager? And they're like, nah, you wouldn't like that. And I was like, no, you would totally <laughs> no. like that. You didn't speak up? Wasn't my place. He wasn't I wearing his pin. I wasn't okay. wearing my pin. <laughs> okay. I had a plane to catch. Yeah. One more final thought on that. Like, I wouldn't say it's like a necessary evil or anything, but I do think that it is like the best that you can do right now in the industry to like go ahead and get yourself certified by the Cicerone program if you want to be a real beer professional. I would agree. Well said. Our next topic is Big Chicken 2022 wrap up. Woo woo! Big Chicken! Big Chicken. Surviving. Yeah. Everyone made it. <laughs> we did it again. Yeah. And uh, this was the first time that we had Big Chicken Week as a part of the on-site cans available and draft available. Oh, yeah. The, the only yeah. previous Big Chicken Week was 100% draft. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like this is like the second. Maybe we've sold Big Chicken the same way twice, once. It is like different every year. I mean, this is because of the pandemic. If these years hadn't been so weird, neither would we be so weird. Uh, <laughs> well, it's also just but it's the, because the thing keeps growing, right? Like, we, we couldn't do day of cans anymore Yeah, because of the scale. We certainly couldn't. I think Big Chicken went to, over, to 250 draft accounts this year. Can't do that in one day. That is anti-exclusivity. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, and, you know, to clarify, we are canning up each area's Big Chicken the day of and delivering it. Yeah. We uh, were canning for the tasting rooms daily, and we were kegging for out in the world daily. Yeah. So, like, if you were in the East Bay and got your Big Chicken on Thursday, that was kegged that morning. Exactly. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say, is you can brew a really big batch of beer and package portions of it throughout the week, which is now what we do. And I think it's a great model for the, like, marketing piece of, like, I'm going to go to a region and show up at three places that are pouring Big Chicken. It was cool. You know, we kind of divide and conquer that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a fun night. Also, uh, very interested in the future of that yeast. Yeah. Holy that beer crap. smelled great. Yeah. That freaking Conan uh, variant yeah. on that. Conan uh, Tropics. Tropics is yeah. insanely good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that was uh, the same in Future on 10, right? No, that cool. was Juice Tropics. Oh, that was Juice Tropics. So Tropics okay. is the thing that comes through, slices the thiols, releases the aromas, and you can marry it to various yeasts. I think in the original, or maybe not the original, but the first one that people were making beer with was the Juice one. Yes. London 3. And then this one on top of a Conan strain. I don't know if it was the Barbarian one we typically use or not. Mm -hmm. Um 
but it made for a pretty non-hazy brew yeah. Yeah. with a very tropical aroma and dried out pretty well without throwing a ton of fusel booze in yes. that aroma too, which is nice and is probably even more mellow now. You know, I've got a couple cans left and I'll, I'll drink them through the next couple of weekends and uh, it's only been, you know, more and more wonderful every time I've tasted it. Yeah, I, I had some a um, couple nights ago after the live stream event, mm-hmm. and uh, I definitely thought, because I did taste it like the first day it was available, and it was delicious, but I definitely yeah. thought like, hmm, it's really hitting that sweet spot right now. Yeah. Also, <laughs> it's like 15 days old or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we do so good. I don't fully understand the science behind this, but we do such a good job at executing our fermentations in such a way that we do not create boozy beers, even when we're into these double digit ABVs. I hate it when someone says, check out this new triple IPA and it tastes like snake venom or it tastes like (laughs) gin on the rocks. Um, I never drink snake venom recreationally, but I've had a few gins I've really enjoyed. But I don't want that, man. I want beer. I don't want spirit. I want right. spirit when it's spirit time and beer when it's beer time. And please keep your fusils to yourself. Um, <laughs> and it is hard. And I don't think I could do it. That's why I'm not our head brewer or even our deputy assistant cellar person. <laughs> um, uh, it's just so nice. And I'm I'm always – actually, I'm not worried anymore. The first couple of years of Big Chicken, I was like, oh, here come the fusils. And they never come. When your beer tastes sharp and boozy, those are fusil alcohols bumming you the heck out. And if you can properly manage your fermentation, that's not supposed to happen, and it doesn't. And I just love that. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough to drop a case of that beer off at Berkeley East, Rad. which ironically is in Oakland. Indeed. But uh, they were so thrilled, and like uh, it was cool how, long, how much those guys knew about our process and our brand and our history. Found out some of them were some of my old regulars at a bar I used to run. Oh, like, no, you guys rule. Yeah, that was that was a really cool, and I, and I hope we get to do more and more with those guys' products. You know, there are, there are fact, factions in this company that think our, our our blonde beers are due for an overhaul, and the original intent of those aroma producing fermentation and organisms mm-hmm. uh, was to mimic hop aromas without having to use hops. Right. So there's something about like, could we make something with a really shelf stable fruity tropical aroma? without having to dry hop the shit out of it mm-hmm. and keeping it real low alcohol. So Yeah, I'd be interested to see what would happen when using a Tropics variant with just a beer that only had like Whirlpool editions or Exactly. You know. Yeah. 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 That'd be that'd be pretty interesting to see. I uh wonder if, you know, there will ever be a Tropics variant with like say Chico, right? Cuz like Conan sure. and uh Juice are both traditionally, at least in the homebrewing world, you know, that they are lending uh desirable traits to a hazy IPA. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, they throw a bunch of esters too. Yeah, but I, while working here, you know, I discovered, well, you don't really need those lower flocculating yeast strains necessarily to achieve a delicious, juicy, hazy beer, you know? There are other things that you can do. So it would be interesting to see what that would represent. Like. I'm sure those guys have done it. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm sure those guys have done it. And, uh, I mean, the amount of experimentation going on in that facility is crazy. And, I mean, there's no reason to stop there. Like, Kolsch yeast. Yeah. Right? They yeah. Have, I mean, they make don't they make a lager yeast that doesn't produce – it's like a Czech lager yeast that doesn't produce diacetyl? Yeah, they yeah. do. And, like – Holy um, shit. Yeah, these dudes are in it, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, they, and it's really cool Future to... Future is now. Yeah. Right? It's really cool to have them this close, you know? Um, them and Admiral. Yeah. And then, you know, now we're talking to a, a guy growing grain and producing malt and growing hops and Pengrove. On the consumption side, the industry has localized a lot over the past two decades. And if, if uh, on the ingredient side and the sourcing side, we're able to, to do that, or to do anything like that, it could be really extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. And then you'll start getting that really cool, like, regional character back into beers, you know? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Bringing that terroir back to mm-hmm. your glass. Before we wrap up this big chicken wrap up conversation, uh, we'd be remiss not to mention all the incredible efforts of the tasting room staff. Tip and the spear. The sales team, <laughs> and literally across the entire company, like, everyone executed their jobs flawlessly. And I don't think I've seen a smoother big chicken in my tenure here. So yeah. well done, everyone. Having no longer being on the sales team, much smoother for me. <laughs> <laughs> <That's fucking> great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I just feel like everyone did an incredible job and just can't shout out the team enough. So Yeah. Cheers, yeah. everybody. Huge. Best damn team. All right. Two topics left. Hell yeah. Second to last. Ooh, this one's mine. Were there really no fucking beer commercials during the Super Bowl? Amazing. Yeah, what the hell was that? I was blown away. Now, 
I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. There were 300 Bud Light commercials. But they were for seltzers. All Bud Light seltzer. Yeah. Yeah. I must have missed the Coors seltzer commercial, but I was told there was a Coors seltzer commercial. I counted one commercial, which I think involved like a horse being like sentimental or something. And then there was a Budweiser logo at the end, but it didn't even say like there was no beer in the commercial. It didn't yeah. say what Budweiser did, which of course at this point they don't have to. Yeah. But I feel like five years ago there were a hundred beer commercials in the Super Bowl. Like, no doubt. It's wild that like are they? Is this like a, a white flag? From I don't know. The it, biggest it, beer companies, and they're like, now nah, we're gonna go box with White Claw. Yeah. What's the what's the signal uh, that they're sending out here? It, it almost makes you a little nervous in a way, you know? Like like is it's like a tsunami kind of thing. You're yeah. like the seas going out. What does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like are they like detaching from what made them the super conglomerates that they are, you know? Well, so I think yeah. it was a year or two ago they had the, like, we're going to mock. I mean, it was straight up the Gandhi shit. It's hilarious, right? Like, first they ignore you, right? Just, right. Just like craft beers, this cute little, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, this fucking those fly around an elephant's ass, right? Then, right? then they attack you, right? No, then they mock you. I remember that commercial. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yeah. yeah, which yeah. they definitely did, yeah. and it's like a bunch of silly-looking dudes, and they still have that commercial, the one where the guy's like, it's with goat's milk, yeah. you know? Um, pumpkin beach wood aged or whatever. Yeah, they're yeah. the, like, drink a dark beer. And then they fight you, which was when... I believe some of their zombie brands got Super Bowl commercials, mm. right? Like they bought up a, a faux craft beer and mm -hmm. propped it up. Zombie brands, I like that. Yeah, I mean it seems apropos. <laughs> uh, not not exactly out here thriving in most of those cases. Yeah, yeah. it's not the golden road to success. <laughs> That's like one of the ones that's doing okay. Um, Great one. But that was, I love that. And any mm. chance to dunk on Golden Road, I'm here. <laughs> um, but then the, the the end of the quote is, and then you win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And part of the reason that is, is obviously seltzer is there's a huge amount of energy toward that market. That shit is incredibly cheap to make and you don't need to keep it cold. Yeah. Right. Right. And so if you have all these pathways to market like a massive brewery does and you're just like, wait, hold up. <laughs> this yeah. is like I need to like make the simplest possible alcohol I can. Yeah. Blend it with some very cheap flavor additives. Carb it up. And I can just leave set it in it my on warehouse the floor forever. of yeah. anywhere forever. Like, yeah. let's go, right? Fuck. Like, nothing to change, nothing to settle. It's yeah. Yeah. And I imagine there's a, a THC adding to those products thing on the horizon that's going to be massive as well. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's just they're just chasing the next buck, but like, it's football, man. The yeah. first ever Coors Light commercial was the, the taste great, less filling was yeah. every football game my, my child. Like, not Shit. a motherfucking one. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, old Cowboys Super Bowl game when I was a little kid in the 90s and the, the Bud White Zerg. Oh, my God, that was great. Frogs. Yep. Like, I, it's iconic. I remember yeah, it. Can we get some seltzer marketing of that quality? I'll do all due respect yeah. to the flavor god, Guy yeah. Fieri. But, it's uh, almost which is in the, the, the only other, like, most <laughs> commercial <laughs> yeah. for sure. Like, if he was there for the, and I don't know if like this was actually commercial, out. if he was there for the Budweiser Seltzer Hard Soda commercial, where they're like, we started with beer, but then decided to instead make a seltzer, and then we added some flavor back to that seltzer. Here we go. At least those are flavors. Yeah. But to have Guy Fieri, hold on, hold on, like, wait, wait. you have to. So they make. So there's a that's hard one product. So hard soda is sugary seltzer. Yeah. It's a back sweetened seltzer. It's back sweetened, dyed, I assume. Yeah. Seltzer. Holy shit. But it's, to have it's Mountain Dew <laughs> hard have, and like this isn't <laughs> hard. This Baja is in no blast. way a dig at seltzer, much like sparkling water or Lacroix. No one's looking for overwhelming flavor experiences. Right. But to have Mr. Triple D pop up and say, I'm Guy Fieri, here to talk about unsalted, unleavened matzah. <laughs> Welcome to Flavor Town. And you're now like, This is flavor. This <sighs> is not even the outskirts of Flavor Town. I'm yeah. in the flavor badlands right now. Like, this yeah, is. Real. Let alone appeasing the flavor god in the epicenter of the flavor universe. Yeah. In that pocket dimension that they were in. Right. Yeah, that is. So he feels his brand is at like 0% risk. He's just like, Yeah, y'all know me. Yeah. <laughs> Triple D, triple G, let's go. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that yeah, that's wild. And it also just, it undermines the most laudable thing about his brand, which has always been my mini issue with him. And Colin and I, Colin loves Guy. Uh, Colin and I have, have had this out a number of times, is like the Triple D mm -hmm. is dope because he goes to somebody's small business. Yes. And bigs him up hella hard. And he Huge. likes everything he eats and he has a great time. And the places usually have some character. Yeah, national well, advertising if you notice, with no pay they don't, for play. I mean, they it. don't usually like say like, damn, this is good. It's usually just like they take the bite and then it's like, yeah, amp this place up. You yeah. never really see him like react 
Like, the food is good, you know? But I think he's going to places that already have loyal local followings. And, like, I mean, he went to Santa Cruz Diner, which yeah, I, ate, I must have eaten, like, at least 150 post-2 a.m. meals at Absolutely. in my college years, you know? Tofu um, scramble. <laughs> Catch me at 245. Not, not what I ordered there. You know, uh, <laughs> as I appreciate uh, all the, like, extra work he's done with the community and stuff, specifically around the fires, I... Will never forgive Guy for the time I was driving behind his yellow Lamborghini with the vanity plate Big Bite, and he threw an empty water bottle out the fucking car <gasps> and fucking littered. Snitching right now. I fucking <laughs> wanted to call the cops so bad. <laughs> that was back in my video store days. <laughs> and now, you know, I, I will never forget. And then... Probably a year later or something, that same yellow Lamborghini was stolen from the Santa Rosa parking lot structure. So, hey, karma, karma motherfucker. Bro. Yeah. Also, that Lamborghini made out of plastic. Shocking. The, but so for me, what I was going to say is, is I wish that that dedication to small businesses went through, because, you know, dude's, dude's making money, but he's making, mm-hmm. you know, when you're cashing checks from Kraft, cashing checks from Budweiser, that's a different caliber of money, right? And it, to me, undermines the, the thing of like, yeah, man, this thing matters to this community. They fuck with doing this burger in this one silly specific way or in this obscene right. way even, you mm-hmm. know? Good word. And, like, let's go celebrate them. And so most of the time I think those episodes are really well done. They're really enjoyable. And I'm like, if I was in that town, I'd hella go to that place. You yeah. Know? Yeah, no um, doubt. You know, and I also do happen to know he he cooked for the Obamas and sourced, like, impeccably from Sonoma County. He had, like, Liberty Duck breast. And like and so it's like, Respect. man, if, you know what That's I'm... That's cool. But in that sense, but then tell the truth. Yeah. Right? Like, when, you're, when it's your ass on the line as a chef, you don't... You don't bring the craft singles, right? right. You, know, like, you don't bring the pre-grated cheese. Um, <laughs> I mean, he might, honestly. I'm telling you, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, he didn't. Like, yeah. he got to cook for the president and yeah. took advantage of the fact that dude's from here. Yeah. And sourced like some of the best ingredients in the country, for right? sure. And a- as I just feel like would. he would have like garnished with some like shitty cheese or something, or sort of, yeah, just yeah. to keep it on brand, just, like making know? sure that it's going out with Tabasco. One so, can yeah. of queso bueno yeah. just kept. I've seen Obama eating like right. shitty hot dogs before, dude. You right. know, yeah, he'll, high he'll culture, low culture on the yeah. same plate. You know, why not? But what does this mean for the future of beer advertising? I don't know, man. Or not for beer advertising, like genuinely for the industry. Like, are they like, do they give a shit about the beer aisle? Are they like, y'all can have the refrigerated section? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of um, what it feels like. And honestly, that's fine with me. It's you know? tremendous, but yeah. it's like happened really fast. I mean, I, I really feel like they were into acquiring craft breweries and like getting ready to come fight us and be in like going and trying to like take over entire draft spectrums and be like, yep. you're going to have your, your golden road handle, your 10 barrel handle, your Elysian handle, you know, like they, yeah. were, like, they were trying to build a portfolio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like, now it's like, let's talk about cans seltzer. of seltzer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I mean, yeah, maybe a softer target there. I don't know. It was like halfway through the game where I was just like, okay, I've seen like 10 seltzer commercials. I haven't seen one beer commercial, and yeah. I was like, I'm sure there was some seltzer getting consumed in that stadium, but there was probably a buttload of beer and a lot of Budweiser beer being sold in that stadium. Yeah. 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 $17 a pop. <laughs> it's uh, this weird argument that I make, like, I eat a lot of fake meat, and people are like, blah, that's gnarly. And I'm like, yeah, but I came up eating trash. So <laughs> it was to go from a McDonald's hamburger to a bunch of extruded soy with uh, grill lines painted on them <laughs> by like a little robot arm in a factory <laughs> is just right down the street from where I, w- I was yeah. right there. And yeah. then I just had to take one little step and then boom, Only I was there. The difference is the source protein. Exactly. Yeah. And when you make your beer progressively lighter and lighter and with less and less flavor, because flavor is something you can love or hate, right. nothing you can't feel anything about. You have to feel nothing about nothing. Because it's nothing. Bruno Mars. Uh, oh, God. Is that one of his songs or something? No. I'm okay. just saying oh, that's right. my music analogy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nothing. The safest possible. See, scene. I was thinking Never Ending Story. One, so, you know, yeah. The nothing. The nothing. The nothing. Yeah. No, that's a bad nothing. I feel bad right. about that nothing. He hurt the guy with the rocks. Right. Yeah, there you go. Thank Look you. Like big, I, strong. I don't have time hands. to cry on this podcast, <laughs> yo. <laughs> Um, I love how that spoke to you, Sarah. It's like, oh, Sarah loves Never Ending Story, too. Dude, oh. <laughs> I, have a, I have a soul. <laughs> right. So, oh, God, I'm being overwhelmed by it. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Our tax, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, no. So, so did that horse commit suicide? Yeah, because right? he was hella sad. Yeah. The yeah. swamp of uh, 
what what's the fucking swamp called? It is like the swamp the, of sadness. I think. Yeah, the swamp of sadness. Yeah, mm. yeah, that yeah. was a little on the nose, but <laughs> what a fucking heavy movie for kids. <laughs> yeah, but what the big multinational beverage manufacturing conglomerates have done, I'm personally arguing, is they have trained palates to expect less and less and less, mm. and then you're like, well, crap. Uh, you want me to have nothing? All right, just a that's just a tiny step down from Bud Light to Bud Light Seltzer to Bud Light Seltzer Hard Soda. Yeah. Yeah, and so they've kind of trained people on not drinking big, flavorful beer. The possible exception of maybe Diageo, because you can say a lot of things about Guinness, but it is not flavorless. I mean, they're, they're coming for the, the Zs, too, you know? Like, yeah. that's what it is really about. Like, the dads of the Gen Zs are drinking the beer, you know? Yeah. Well, I and also, then I, everyone else is like, give me a fucking White Claw, you know? Right. Uh, I think we might also be being a little uh, Western world-centric. Mm. Like, like, keeping shit cold and building a draft system in like the developing world or the tropical world or near the equator where it's fucking hot all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. Having like shelf stable, dry, refreshing, lightly fruity beverages for the world is probably a good idea, particularly because sure. it can be produced really cheaply. But I also I still think the solution eventually for that, like I think like when they were going really aggressively after the Hispanic market and trying to bring, you know, craft beer via either Ballast Point or Lagunitas into that market, I think they're just kind of conspiring in their own demise. Like, if you teach these people to like IPA and you have to keep it cold and you have to have a functioning draft system, some local person's going to make fresh IPA, yeah. mm -hmm. show it to people, and, and be, be like, like oh, this is way better. It, it works on that same draft system. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know? The draft system's hen house gets poured on. Even yeah. in this, like, very advanced, early adopting community when it comes to craft beer, wasn't many craft breweries building those draft systems. Like yep. Big distributors built those draft systems. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if like, you know, you're looking at massive emerging markets in China and India and they're just like, we're gonna skip that fucking stage. Right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there'll be some kind of byproduct from GMO yeast in the future that prevents oxidation. We can just have warm canned future beer, you know, in those Oh areas. totally. Um <laughs> I'm listening to someone studying on studying for the BJCP and they're like, you know, part of the beer judge test is when you grade homebrew, you're supposed to hit them with tips. You're like, I'm tasting diacetyl, and here's how you, here's how you fix that. And then in like 2032, it's going to be like, use a non-diacetyl producing yeast. Wrong. Like, that's what that's going to mm. be the tip. It's yeah. not going to be manage your fermentation better. It's like, why did you buy the yeast that makes your beer gross, dummy? Like, yeah. Use perfect yeast that never screws yes up. Yes and no. Yeah. Because almost every time a beer ingredient has come out, its ideal utilization isn't its intent. Sure. Right? Like all of the big famous aroma hops were things Budweiser was making to make yep. it cheaper to bitter Budweiser. Yeah. Right? Not all, but a lot of them. But a lot of them. These guys at, at Berkeley Yeast, who are now the cutting edge for aroma in hoppy beer, were trying to replace hops. Right. 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 So who knows? There might be another byproduct of that non diacetyl producing lager yeast that we fall in love of when we use it in a certain way. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's it's this feedback loop of like ingredient goes out into the world and it's not what the producer of the ingredient says it is, it's what the people who who use that ingredient say it is. Right. Right. Yeah. And at least so far, we talked about this as like part of the why the fun on ten thing was so important is the like why the fuck not aspect. Like yeah. let's try it. Let's see what happens with this. And so who knows what will come of those things. And you know, a lot of the hop aromas people are freaking out about now. If a hop cultivar had made a hop that smelled like that in 1995, they would have called it inappropriate for beer and left it on a rack. Yeah. yeah. Right? So like what's a flaw, what's a feature, like all that stuff continues to evolve. So yeah, I, I don't I don't think you should get too determinist at the ingredient level. No. Yeah. Right. Like London Three is called London Three, not not because it made beers like the way that London Three beers taste now. Right. 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 Like, right. Um, so its original of, intent was something completely so a whole different. A lot of whole lot of like mm -hmm. yeah. chubby dark beer. Yeah. <laughs> it was fermented on on London Three. <laughs> chubby dark beer. The hell yeah. The last topic. Black IPA. Is it coming back? More broadly, is there a place in the current beer world for non adjunct? Dark beer. Yeah, absolutely. It is poised for a renaissance. Dark beers coming back. We're going to break this uh, seasonality thing. Maybe we even start marketing them as session pastry stouts <laughs> just to get people. Like, they're like, God, this is great. And you're like, it's a, just a great dark lager. We've been making these forever, but... I feel like the pastry. original marketing convention for that was trying to do that. Like, that's why they called them black IPAs, right? Yeah. So people would, like, actually give it a try. Yes. But, I mean, everyone loves a comeback, right? Mm-hmm. I think people want to see 
black IPA championed yet again, and we Will shall it, lead the charge. So that the question's worth asking because they they have been showing up, right? Like we ran into a really delicious one in Portland. Yes, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shout out to uh, Steeple, Steeple Steeplejack Steeplejack and Steeplejack. Great yeah, oh, man, Colabo. That was on my list. I made it to Wayfinder and uh, also made it to Ruse and Chuckanook, I think, is the other one. Yeah. Well, so, and I think yeah. that if we're going to bring this up, we got to shout out is it Reef? Rip. Rip. Yes. Rip Brewing has kind of never come off. They're, they're a San Diego area yeah. brewery, and they just never left the Black IPA train. Oh, really? They're a very yeah. hip, hophead brewery, kind of Altamont ish in palette. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, God, that's a great description. Those guys should collab. Yeah, I mean, I'm least, sure they have. At least be in a room together. Yeah, they Shit. also they like I like they also look like each other. It's yeah, um, but can uh, we be involved? Like, let's go. <laughs> <you know>? Yeah, <laughs> um, but but yeah, super neutral ferment, very very clean hop aroma, uh, which I think you need if you're going to do the black IPA thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it it wouldn't have been something I would have predicted in coming back, even though anything you can slap IPA on seems like a good idea in a way from yeah. a marketing standpoint. But like, I don't know, I'm interested in it. Yeah, I'd love to see it come back. And the best case for me would be if it somehow allows us to make crushable dark beer again. Yeah, we have to figure out how to. In black IP, maybe that's where black IPA is useful. I'm thinking while I'm talking here, but that it is a very easy verbal shorthand for like this is not going to be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's something I've never thought about with this beer, but definitely is a thing. Like, could you have like a a sweeter like? Double IPA that was a black double IPA. I've never seen a black dipa. I don't think actually. Oh yeah, they did it all. There was that. I was here for that moment. It was yeah. wild. It was a dark moment. It was. Um, uh, dude, but I do. I, yeah, I remember when IPAs just generally like could be between like seven and nine percent, and they'd still just call it an IPA. But now. Most of the time, it's like a double IPA Thanks after eight the and proliferation a half. of Cicerones. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I think it's a fun thing to keep an eye out there for. I'm really now just like super taken with the idea of making a low alcohol stout and calling it anti-imperialist. Ah, I'm here, I'm here for that. It sounds great. Yeah. Um, you were saying darker session beers, and um, I was reminded of the Alpha and Omega from Drake's. They had the, I think it was the Omega was the dark one. It was like a black session IPA. Oh, yeah. And nice. I yeah, really with Black like IPA it. hit, man. Yeah. And we're, we're you know, all due respect to the good folks at Deschutes, we're really just ignoring the Cascadian dark ale term. That um, was what I was just about to bring up. Yeah. yeah. Imperial Cascadian dark ale when you get into the double IPA gravity. <laughs> Session Cascadian dark ale. Yeah, I remember like seven years ago, I went up to Hopworks Urban Brewery and they had a CDA on there. Yeah. And I was like, this is a black IPA, right? And they're like, no, we call that Cascadian dark ale around here, boy. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Yeah. But what a more innocent time in our industry. I do still love that name. Black IPA communicates so much better to a lot of folks. And then you get the, how is it, how is it a pale ale if it's black? And I, I said that once. That Those words have left to my lips for sure. But Cascadian Dark Ale just sounds cool and kind of mysterious. And to me, it's more descriptive than Black IPA. Like, yeah. I really know what I'm getting. And ideally, if you're doing a Cascadian Dark Ale, you are using Pacific Northwest hops because that's that's part of it. That's where the Cascades right. are. So it's going to tell me a little bit more about the uh, flavor profile that are going to come from those hops. But that is, I'll fully uh, admit, that's pretty insider baseball. That's like not on the Cicerone test. Yeah. When you read Cascadian <laughs> and you're like, ooh. Is pine, there Cascade in there? Can roast. you call it Cascadian Dark Ale without having Cascade? I would say you don't need Cascade itself. But Just you need, the, you need, you need one of its hops. relatives. You have C. Yeah. C hop. Like yeah, Mount, so what happens, if I, Hood. what happens if I want to throw uh, some Southern Hem in there? Do I need to come up with a different Adian? Flag on the field. Well, it is the, so Blown now I have, a, I have a New Zealandian Dark Ale? Yeah, it could or, be uh, if, I, no. if, I'm using, dark if I'm using ale. Southern Passion, I have like a Cape Dark Ale? Yeah. All right. What's the opposite of pale, too, right? Uh, dark. Is it dark? Yeah. I mean, shucks and beer could be amber. It could be shadow, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's no. Not, <laughs> not at all. Light and shadow. Not at all. But <laughs> I was just thinking, like, how come I haven't seen, you just made me think, like, how come I haven't seen India Dark Ale before, you know? Because as Colin says, IPA just means hop aroma. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to get to with that, is that, that IPA doesn't mean, I like, no longer an acronym. Yeah. yeah. It's a word. Mm -hmm. uh, which has happened to other words. It's true. There was an India Brown. There was Red IPA. Don't forget was, White IPA. Yeah. White IPA. Chain breaker chain so yeah yeah very good dude that there's an era it's yeah. like it's like rap songs from the late 90s and early 2000s and beer styles from the like 
from like 05 to 2011. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm stoked. Dude, I remember Chainbreaker. I, I, could I like, really like Chainbreaker. I could recite like a Monk's Kettle list from like mid 2009 right now. I also enjoyed Sharkinator from um, our friends at Lost Coast. It was Great White, but the IPA version. It was their white IPA. Oh, yeah. yeah. And white generally means wheat added, right? Yeah. It's yeah. actually yeah. just IPA now. Yeah. It is just IPA. It's like now. fermentation yeah. character. Like maybe you didn't put the coriander in it, but it's like fermentation character and hella wheat. Like, yeah. That's just what I remember IPA drinking white like IPAs and yeah. be like, you know, I've seen lighter IPAs than this, but whatever. Right. <laughs> it's a strange time as well. But, anyways, no, I hope. No, it's fine. It's hazy. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the uh, black IPA makes its way around. Also, be another interesting way I think to like do something exciting in the IPA world with flagship, mm-hmm. because I'm sure there is a fermentation character that can also be in conversation with serious hop aroma and some dark malt character. But like, mm-hmm. I ain't found it yet. Yeah. Um, and what would a thial producing or unlocking yeast strain do to a black IPA, I wonder. Bob, I got nothing on that, but (laughs) full of fascinating questions. Um, Because these styles are being pulled, as I understand it, out of the malt. That's like where we're getting a lot of this stuff from. So Mm -hmm. to get that dark, that malt has undergone a lot of chemical changes within it, and I don't so know what that does burn. to the <clears throat> But I wonder if it needs or a fermentable sugar better, from the lighter or or malts to be able to do that in the first place. Those are all still energy, in the black right? IPA. They're yeah. just, a, just, it's just less really of dark them. malt change color. Yeah. 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 Word. Well, let's talk to our friends at Berkeley Yeast. Yeah, we should let's get, get a pilot mm-hmm. system. Jesus. Yeah. Right? We're oh, find hell out. yeah. We should just have a podcast beers series yeah. in Fairfax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alex Whitehurst just you fucking know Alex Whitehurst just got angry. For that. Yeah. Nah. No, he'd be stoked, I think. Yeah. yeah. Just make some nonsense we come up with at the end of the podcast every week. <laughs> yeah, he's got <gonna laughs> every uh, week, maybe just like <laughs> <laughs> like once or six times a year. Um, this concludes <laughs> the first ever grab bag episode. I think um, we did pretty good. I yeah. think we did good too. Yeah, I had a fun that. time. Blame Ruse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame Ruse. <laughs> They're working on cool stuff. But anyway, that was fun. I'm glad to do that with y'all. They got those tasting room opening blues. Bam, bam, bam. We can yeah. relate, right? Yeah. 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 Also, is that public? House Unruffled was created by Anna Scott. We record at Hen House Brewing Company's Palace of Barrels in Petaluma, California. Our producer is Brian Henderson, and our associate producers are Josh Staples and Fridge. The music you've been listening to was written and performed by our San Francisco account rep McLean from his album Speechless and Speechless 2, which you can find on Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, and anywhere one finds dope music. If you have a question or comment about this or any episode of Hen House Unruffled, please let us know by calling 707-347-9425 to leave a message. You can also send an email to podcast at henhousebrewing.com. For more information, visit www.henhousebrewing.com or stop by one of our Bay Area tasting rooms. The voice you've been listening to is Imani Russell Black. Please listen and drink responsibly. Hey, Unruffled listeners, if you haven't already, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to go the extra mile, give us a rating and a review on the platform of your choice. We'd be hella stoked if you did. Cheers.